So uh, this session, if you're here, we're going to talk about data center stuff. Kind of my, uh, you know, it's been, there's a lot of really great things going on in this uh, conference. A lot of them go pretty low and deep, and uh, those are important. Uh, I um, want to have a conversation around the data center and uh, automation, and that can go in a number of different directions. Uh, Docker, for sure, if you want. Uh, that wasn't what was proposed, but it fits into the ecosystem, for sure. Um, DCOS, Mesos, and uh, I had, if, if you're not familiar, it says K8S, which is Kubernetes. Um, that's, for some reason, the cool kids in San Francisco like to abbreviate things with numbers. So, anyway. Uh, I, I really do want it to be a discussion. Uh, it is my impression or expectation that a lot of this is so new that it's worth maybe uh, 15 minutes is what I was thinking. Maybe it's uh, plus or minus depending on people having uh, immediate questions, which is fine and great. Uh, is that fair, uh, to set it up for 15 minutes? And then I think uh, that will, there's, there are, for sure, there are at least a couple people here at the conference that already were uh, well aware of Mesos, what it does, and maybe even have been playing with it, like uh, Nicholas. So, uh, but I need everybody else to kind of come up to the same conversational level, if that makes sense. So I do have some slides. Uh, I, I, you know, the only purpose of the slides really is just to have a talking point to hit a couple of uh, conceptual ideas, and I don't, and, and I may jump around in them. So if you see something on there that we didn't touch on, I'm not ignoring it. Just, just say, hey, let's stop for a second. Uh, so, uh, so first of all, I three years ago I was heading up research and development with Savas, which is part of CenturyLink. Uh, in in the U.S., it's like the third largest ISP, uh, and they. Uh, to our group, they said, hey, we want to know where the cloud is going. We're like way behind. Everything they did was pretty high touch. We want to kind of compete with Amazon. We want to know where the cloud is going. So, you know, my job was to predict the future, <laughs> which is almost impossible in our industry, right? Uh, let alone outside of our industry. Uh, but there were three things that we concluded on within about six months that were rock stars that we thought had legs that were going to be huge. And it's, it's pretty gutsy to go out there and put that prediction out there it's even better that you, can, you kind of feel verified in some ways when it actually, finally, people are picking up on it. So the three things, just to put it out there real quick, were um, Docker, which at the time was 0.3 and 0.5 uh, at the time frame we were evaluating. Uh, Mesos, Apache Mesos, which I'm going to talk quite a bit about. Well, we are going to talk a lot about in here, I suppose. Uh, and the other one would be uh, CoreOS. And CoreOS is kind of the wild card, and we knew that up front. It's like, well, there's other options too, like Ranch. Uh, there's, there's other things. It's, so if you're not familiar, CoreOS is the lightest, smallest weight Linux distro. Uh, it just has enough guts in it to spin up Docker. That's, that's the whole concept. It also is probably the earliest, it's probably the earliest uh, release of System D. And um, if you're not familiar in the Linux space, we've had different opinions on how we want to init a system and how we want to uh, manage logs. Um, so you're either going to probably go out to varlog syslog or you're going to go out to D messages, depending on which platform you're on. And we're all standardizing that now on system D uh, and journal and things like that. So if you're not up to speed on that, it's probably worth taking a look at. And all of that, uh, all the things we're going to talk about in here are, are Java living inside of a C group. And um, the thing I was interested in speaking with a number of people here, and I've done that, which I'm excited about, was what, what happens is Java inside of a C group world? And I don't know if we have room or time in this discussion to get into it, but if we do, it'd be great. All right, so legacy. The, the hard part with the word legacy is that uh, this is probably the current data center for most people. So it's kind of a play on words and it's intentional. Uh, but the reality is, is there's some leading uh, companies out there, Google, uh, Netflix, Twitter, things of, like, of that nature, and they have what I think is the data center that is uh, going to be most common. So I actually think this is one of those game-changing tech t topics here. I realize it's just a few people, but probably people here mainly for Java and not really looking at where the industry is going. So how do you know you're in a legacy data center? There's a couple of things that are really obvious. The first is that it's statically partitioned, and all that means is we take hardware, we slice and dice into VMs, uh, and then we say, hey, those nine things are for Hadoop, and those ten things are for Tomcat. So we, we statically partition, and the model that we have here uh, is, they're not mutually exclusive, but we tend to have two models. One is, is that we have a recipe, and we, say, we point a recipe at a naked VM and say, make it so. You cookie cut that thing, right? The more mature way and the more common way um, is that you have a, a, an image, and you just hydrate that image. Uh, and usually that image was created also by a recipe of some sort. It just has a different life cycle to it. 
and, and so traditionally, the interesting thing about this, there's a couple of uh, side effects to this that are really worth looking at. And the first is, if you're, in, if you're Netflix and you are spinning up, if you need to scale, uh, you, you couple two things together. Traditionally, we've always coupled these things together and architecturally, we can't even break them apart. We don't discuss them separately. And that is capacity and scale. If I want more scale, I spin up another instance of a thing, I add capacity, I add scale, they go hand in hand. Uh, and so I, I want to break that model. That's the first idea is that. Uh, the other challenge here in aesthetically partitioned world is if I want to do this, you know, I, I have a lot of analytical things I want to do. I want to repartition things. Uh, that takes days, if not weeks, for most organizations. Um, and this is really small. Uh, you get into, I can't talk specific numbers, but Twitter's like tens of thousands of nodes and closely approaching another zero on the end. So they're really, really big. Uh, and, and the thing is, is that if you have, in fact, the, the other way to identify a legacy data center is that you have 10,000 chef recipes or Ansible salt, something, right? You have some way of describing things. And that means that everything's a special snowflake, right? Uh, and you can't do that when you have tens of thousands of nodes. You can do that when you have tens of nodes or hundreds of nodes, maybe thousands of nodes. But. So this becomes a real uh, I had it off the whole time? Wow, okay. <laughs> Sorry, that, yeah. 
Uh, the other the other point that be made with Mesos is resource utilization, and uh, you know if you s if it, the traditional approach is that you s you take a, a service, you stick it in a VM. Uh, question: How how big is that VM? Like, well, how do you manage capacity planning, right? And then, now think about it for, from two different angles. One is what you have in the node uh, on the VM itself. The other is is look at the entire cluster. Um, the statistics are that most data centers are less than 20% utilized. When I went to Hamburg to work at a specific company, which I won't name, uh, you know, you, you have that traditional, hey, why are we here, how we define success moment, and their, their response was, our data center is 5% utilized. Now that in play, uh, you know, to take that another direction, uh, Two Sigma was one of our first clients, and I work for Mesosphere, which, so now I completely work on Mesos every day. Um, and it's all open source, I'm an Apache committer, that kind of thing, so. Uh, Apache, uh, now, f first of all, Two Sigma is the, the second largest hedge fund in the world. They created a huge cluster, and their claims is that they're 96% utilized. And it's a hugely different ap uh, application. They're doing analytics, and that's, it's easier to kind of saturate an, a cluster in an analytic space. But, but, but think about the capacity planning you do. Now, how, how big do you create this data center? And the typical model is, uh, what's my peak time, what's my peak season and my peak time, and times that by two or three. That seems to be the common model, and that's, that's, that's very simplified, I get it, but that seems to be what we end up with. And we have a ton of data center capacity. Now this led Google in the 90s to ask a very uh, interesting question. Our business is web search for the most part. I have a lot of uh, underutilized machines in my data center at some point in time, in, at any given point in time. And the question is, is, what if I could use that for business value? Right. And they created something called the Google Borg, and at the time it was top secret. They would, it w they would still take that around and show universities, and one of those universities was UC Berkeley, which is where Ben Hyman was. And you can think of Apache Mesos as an open source uh, inspired by Google Borg. It's, it's, it, the Google Borg is very specific to Google, and it's monolithic, and Apache Mesos is a two-level scheduler where the intelligence of scheduling is withheld. It's up to you to create a scheduler but all the abstraction layers of how to work in a cluster are, are built into the kernel. So let me show a little bit about what that means. So there's the Google Borg uh, releasing it to blah, 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 blah. Uh, if you look at Google's research, they're actually moving to Omega. They've been working on Omega for four years now. I don't know if they have it in production, but the Borg still is in existence and pretty much what they use. Um, I'm gonna bypass that. Uh, let's see here. Oh, you know what? Something worth looking at too, if you, um, uh, and, uh, and, then, and then I'm gonna jump to more on the technology side. Uh, if you search for Apple and Mesos uh, and Siri, that's good. Uh, internal to the company, we weren't even allowed to use the, the word Apple for the longest time, it was quite funny. Uh, the code name inside the company, we called them the banana stand, <laughs> which is hilarious, because there's always money in the banana stand. Um, but in April of this year, they said, uh, April of last year, they said, hey, you know, can we talk about it? So they m moved their entire Siri data center uh, um, uh, to, to Mesos, and, and their code name internally is called Jarvis. So if you look it up, you'll find details on it. Um, uh, so w why? What is the benefit? So the thing to know about virtual machines is that they consume between uh, 7 and 15% of the data center, uh, and I usually just round that out as an even 10%. So 10% of your data center is consumed by guest OSs and hypervisors and things that provide all the, the logistics associated, or yeah, all the details associated with virtualization. So what happened with Apple? Oh, here's another aspect of virtualization that's super important to realize, is that it sucks when scaling I.O. Um, it, it, that's why you're never gonna have a, a heavily uh, hammered database on a virtualized platform, if you can control it. You know, If you're in the cloud, yeah, you're gonna use Cassandra, you're gonna create something to, to manage this concern, but. Uh, it, it has a terrible issue with, uh, with, with I.O. Sc uh, scalability. So by moving to Apache Mesos, what I haven't said yet is that we can be on a virtualized platform or we can be on bare metal, which is great, right? Uh, they got rid of all virtual machines uh, in their Siri data center. They have a highest level of scalability now that's possible from a bare metal platform. They no longer pay subscription fees for VMs. And they gain 10% of a very, very large data center for free. Like they already bought it, right? It's theirs. They just no longer consume it with virtualization type things. So we have a really great story from that perspective, um, uh, meaning from the open source standpoint. Another thing to be said is like a few years ago, this predates me getting involved with Mesos, but um, HubSpot moved to Mesos. Uh, and they were completely on EC2. So it's a different story. It's a cloud story as opposed to a bare metal story. 
uh, and they did this. Uh, they reduced, the, they went to Mesos mainly for administration, that was in operations. They wanted to reduce operational costs. Uh, but what they also gained out of that, surprisingly to them, was they reduced their Amazon bill uh, by 50%. They went from 160K a month to 80K a month. And it has to do with all the things you see up here. We, I guess I should blow that up so it's visible. But uh, we, we do some bin packing so we can put more than one thing inside the VM. So now you're, you have a bunch of idle VMs that you just start closing down. And of course, you're going to want to have enough VMs to have fault tolerance covered for you. But the VM and all its wasted space could be actually utilized. Right? So that's the core concept. And I think that's probably enough to get, oh, you know what? I could show off some stuff real quick. Um, let me, let me define the architectural component so that we can have the conversation. Um, so we take a cluster, we make it look like one machine for the most part. Uh, we don't care if it's bare metal VMs or some combination. Uh, and then this picture usually seems to work for a lot of people, is that the infrastructure usually has at least one master, but you could have, uh, in an HA world, you'd have at least three. And for the highest number of nines, you would have five, and there's reasons. But you have a quorum of masters that manage the entire cluster. You have a quorum of zookeepers, which manage the basically leadership election. We've reduced our dependency on zookeeper a little bit over the years. Uh, we've changed the name as well from slave to agent. So we have Mesos agents, little instances that run uh, on, on every node. And then, as I mentioned, it's, it's this abstraction layer. In fact, a great analogy probably is this. Uh, so if you have a Unix platform, uh, you have a kernel, you have an init system, uh, and then you have an application. And those applications actually don't know that they're on a specific kernel version. They're abstracted from that. If you're building against the kernel, compiling against the kernel, you're probably building a driver. Um, but uh, these other applications are no drivers. They're just applications running on that platform. If you look at what we're doing with Apache Mesos, is the Mesos is the kernel. Uh, we have a scheduler um, that, that has intelligence. And the intelligence it has is, you told me to start up this process, uh, and it stopped. And my job is to keep it running. So it's the init system of the data center. And it doesn't care where it lands unless you give it instructions, um, which we can talk about. I don't know what people's interests are. And these applications don't know they're running on, on Mesos. They have no idea. They're just applications. Uh, if you are compiling against the Mesos kernel, you're probably building a driver. In our world, we call it a framework. And a framework is a specialized scheduler. It's something that has uh, different orchestration needs or um, failure recovery type mechanisms. So I am a committer on something called uh, HDD, uh, on, uh, HDFS's scheduler for Mesos. So why would you build a scheduler? Why would you build something very unique? We already have this thing that spins up an application and keeps it running. Why would you do something special? Well, in the case of, in the case of HDFS, there's a very specialized order that things are started up in, and then there's a specialized way that you might recover things. So first you start up journal nodes, then you start up name nodes. When you start up the name nodes, you have two if you're HA, you have one that's formatting, you have one that's bootstrapping, and you have to know all those things. Well, that's why we have a specialized scheduler. You don't want a human to go in there and say, yeah, just spin this up in this way and spin this up in that way. You want a system that self um, recovers and you want something that you don't have to babysit. In fact, the latest work that, that I was working on this, this last half of the year is we have um, Cassandra running on this where we can update Cassandra from 222 to 225, for instance, while it's running uh, without service downtime, right? So we actually literally handle all those details. Yeah. So one of the uh, issues you have with JVMs is that they're very bursty on uh, on CPU usage because wh when the GC kicks in, it's usually parallel. Suddenly, mass is, needs a lot of cores. And then the rest of the time, it might not be uh, needing that. And if you start packing them in together, um, that's fine if the GC cycles don't coincide. But if they do, then you start getting really long pauses. You have to be very careful about packing in JVMs together on a on a on a, a box where they're sharing CPUs. So it's an interesting point. I will say, like, I don't know if I've dove into uh, all the things that you're referring to. Um, we're fairly new at including Java into this picture. In fact, we would love to see more Java, uh, uh, you know, as part of the whole microservice-based architectures of things. But I will say this, that there is, um, there are a couple of uh, Java processes. Uh, for instance, HDFS and Kafka. Uh, under heavy loads, they have a, a heavy impact on memory and a heavy impact on page caching. You're paging out, right? Uh, we often talk about wanting things to live close together. Um, so you want Spark close to data, that kind of thing. Uh, but there are, the opposite is true. 
you, know, you never really want to have, under heavy load, a Kafka instance landed on the same node as an HDFS instance, ever, because um, the page cache becomes really a resource at that point. They'd be competing. So uh, yeah, and, and we have an ability with, I can show you details, we have an ability to annotate um, you know, uh, those kind of details, I guess. So in other words, it would self-heal. In fact, I don't have my original demo working, but I, I pulled out a version of DCUS running. This one's on a, um, AWS. So uh, I have my cluster manager here, which is an internal resource we have at Mesosphere. I spun up a cluster. Um, and just to get us started, I'm going to go to the universe, which is our packaging. So if what would you expect from an operating system? Um, I would expect that I should be able to have a package management tool, like I can do an app get install or yum install. I need to be able to do something like that. I have some packaging, right, to be able to get an application there. So one of those applications that we have prepackaged is like Cassandra. So while this may take a few minutes, so I'll just get it started, and then as we're having a conversation, we'll come back and revisit it. And this is slow. It's not good. Okay. Uh, if we want the defaults, I'm just saying just install the defaults. And the other thing I would add is this. Uh, by the way, I don't know how long it would take for you to get a Cassandra ring installed into your data center, but this is going to take like 10 minutes probably, I would guess. Um, and I realize it's with defaults. Um, one of the problems that people tend to have is I, I don't know how to debug in this world. Like, how do I debug? I, how do I know where to go, right? Uh, well, uh, we have a whole command line as well as the UI. Uh, I could say package, if I could spell, package install, man. We already have Cassandra installed, so, well, you know what? From the command line, we'll need this, though. Let's say we want the uh, CLI of the Cassandra installed on my local machine. So while the process is being installed in the, the, the server, I need to add additional command subcommands to DCOS at the command line level to be able to interact with that. So that's what's being installed right now, and it might take a little bit of time for that to get downloaded. Let's jump over here and go to demo mode. Say DCOS. If you, Th those are the options that you have. I can auth. Uh, we have two options. This is completely open source stuff that I'm, we're talking about here. Um, so I could say DCOS, um, give me the list of nodes. So those are all the nodes that are in my data center. Now realize I'm executing commands that are on my laptop that are going against Amazon, really. And this is an exceedingly slow, so I'm not sure what's going on entirely, but we'll see in a second. What's that? Yeah, so there's a list of nodes. But here's the beautiful part. I could say, give me a list of services or give me a list of tasks. Uh, so if I get a list of tasks, I can see what's running. And by now, we probably should have one instance of Cassandra up. You'll see it uh, in a second. And then we can do some really crafty things, things that uh, might surprise you. Um, while we're waiting for that, just to give you an idea, I can do, and I don't know if I'll remember the exact command line, but I can say uh, DCOS task, we had a, Response time failure. Can D seven Q D seven Q okay. So I can say DCOS task um, tail follow um, and then maybe Cassandra, right? So uh, and I can abbreviate to say Cassandra. Cassandra. Uh, what that would do uh, is actually do a tail of my logs that are on some random node out there in the cloud somewhere. And in this particular case, because it wasn't specific to a, a specific ID, it would be every instance of Cassandra that, um, that is running in the cluster at this time. So I'd actually be following, in this case by default, it'd be standard out, but I could also say I want to I see standard error. Uh, or anything that's in the sandbox. Uh, and I know that might, uh, maybe you're not familiar with that yet. I can also do the same thing here, tail, and say I want to tail uh, the leader. We'll see if this comes back for us. Where did I do wrong? Oh, log. Yeah. <laughs> tail. <laughs> that's fine. Uh, and so then we're looking at the Mesos master log at this point, if it will come back. So anyway, let's open up for some discussions. Uh, uh, DCOS is what I've shown. DCOS, uh, Ben Heidman is the creator of Apache Mesos. He's the leader uh, of the PMC for the most part. Um, 
uh, he said that DCOS is his mature idea of where he thought Apache Mesos would go. So uh, it's kind of the next evolution of things. It's completely open source, as I mentioned. We do have an enterprise version, which is mainly security. Um, and then we could also talk about Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a Google uh, implementation. Uh, the purpose of that is really, it's an opinionated pass solution for running Docker. Uh, it does, uh, and when I say opinionated, here's the easiest way to understand that. It's not meant to be completely negative. It's, it's just opinionated. Uh, Maven is an opinionated build tool. Um, if your opinion matches it, it's actually pretty cool. It's fast and there's some really great benefits to it. If your opinion ever does not match Maven, it, your life sucks for a while. It's, it's terrible until you get rid of it. Like, you know, it's just, so that's the same thing with Kubernetes. Kubernetes is an opinionated solution. Um, it gives us like a slant 24 to each node, and I am, although that probably matches a huge number of use cases, um, I, could, I can think of solutions for which a slant 24 is insufficient on a node, depending on node size. So anyway, why don't we open it up? I could obviously dig in deeper, uh, but it's really supposed to be a conversation at this point. So. Uh, yeah. Schedulers that we have that are listed here in the universe, um, the ones that come on default would be Marathon, which is long running processes. We used to have something called Kronos, which was for uh, time-based or cron jobs in the data center. We've now recently moved that to something called Metronome, and that literally is a release uh, this week, so. No questions at all? Yes. So here's the here's the cool part when we oh go ahead. Well, I'm not clear on what you want to speed up. Yeah, good questions. Great, great comment. For packaging? Yeah. Uh, I'll start with that one because it's going to be simple. Uh, I, and I used to be the gatekeeper for everything that went into the universe. So the universe, first of all, is literally just a, um, a it's a homebrew inspired packaging. Uh, and so currently today, uh, it's not coming up very fast, but I'm going to a GitHub location where the universe package definition is. This is my fork of it, but it's, it's irrelevant. Um, and so if we were to take a look at an example, we're modifying this just a tad over the next couple releases. And the only reason for that is uh, we have people who want to run this in a private data center, in which case they're never going to go to a public net to get to download uh, these kind of packages. So we need to be able to create uh, an environment where that's possible. So. Uh, and we do have clients running this on, on a private data center. In fact, one of, one, of the <laughs> one of the clients I would hesitate to mention, but I, I'll do it, is the U.S. government. So has the largest cluster I know of. <laughs> so this is what it is. There's uh, several JSON files. The core of it is that everything launches on Marathon. And then th the beauty of that, actually, is that if you're launched by Marathon, Marathon's job is to make sure you're always running. So it's self-healing for your scheduler. So this is the H. DFS scheduler. Uh, this is the definition of marathons. So there's a lot of details here I could walk through if we wanted to. Uh, the core of what gets, uh, the, the, the core of the definition of versions is in the package. So this is the package definition. And then this is the list of resources that make up this thing called uh, HDFS. No, not. Yeah, that, that's a.
Not, not today, but there's a, I think there's a, I think that's an issue we're going to work on for the next release. Um, it, it, it came up as a, 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 a desire, right, as a feature request. So uh, the question, if you didn't hear it, uh, is, hey, can you put more than one package inside of a package? And we do have, uh, uh, we have people working on the universe uh, that have multiple pa uh, packages that go together, like we've has the Weave Probe as well as the Weave Scheduler or something like that, and it's necessary to have both. Uh, and Marathon has the capability of doing groups and managing groups together, so there's really no technical reason. It's just really a, a missed in the packaging. That's a great question. Your, the the follow-on to your other question, though, is on speed-ups. Depends on whether you want to do DCOS or Mesos. So in the Mesos world, um, people who decide to use Mesos alone uh, take over control of what their nodes look like completely. And so when you go into the space, one of the challenges that you run into is, is this question. What, what goes into my chef recipe, right? Let me, let me talk directly to the mic. What goes into my chef recipe? Because now I'm confused. Stuff goes in Docker, some stuff goes somewhere else, stuff goes on a node. If you're controlling the node completely, you might install Java on every one of the nodes, in which case it's pre-provisioned, and then the only thing you're doing is, or and frank, frankly, you could have Tomcat already on the node, and then all you're doing is part of your job is launching instances of that or something like that. Our philosophy is not to do that. Um, our philosophy with DCOS is you should expect nothing to be on the node, uh, which gives us the ability to do updates and upgrades without having any impact to what your job is. If a node goes down, you re-recover on another node that has unknown versions of things, uh, it never affects you. So when you get into the world of the data center, your focus in production is repeatability and reproducibility and consistency uh, with the deployments of things. And, and we frankly have been terrible at that as an industry, um, and generally speaking. Um, we've gotten pretty good at CI, we're really bad at CD. Uh, or, and then we certainly don't have any standardization around CD, meaning continuous delivery. So we're hoping to have an influence on that. So you can control that if you like. Um, the other thing that you could do, um, and I'm surprised we don't have a service for this. I would like to see one, maybe we need a feature request. But uh, m uh, many organizations are using Docker now, and you could actually prefetch or preload your nodes with, with Docker instances. And even in the case where you shouldn't expect anything to be on a node, you could start spin up a task that knows, here's the list of uh, Docker instances that I need. Go around and make sure those all exist within the cluster. So that's a reasonable thing to do if you wanted to. It's a fairly simple thing to do, really. Um, I can show you what I mean. Once you, uh, the latency associated with startup time, like I said, it'll take a while before um, Cassandra's up and running, and it's running now. Um, it, it, almost all of it is the latency of pulling the image, uh, the Docker image. They're just large, you know. Uh, that said, this, this has a health check on it, so that's why it's green bar. Something to know, the health check on this does a CSQ uh, invocation. So if you can do CSQ, it's not that the process is up and running. I can literally talk the language of Cassandra, right? Which is a really big deal. In fact, one other thing, if the command line works, we had some latency issues, but now that I had, uh, well, there's the output of the leader. <laughs> um, let's go back over here. If I say DCOS Cassandra, connection, uh, now what it should do is give me a JSON layout of, of the nodes. Uh, how, how do I bootstrap my connection for Cassandra? So that's it right there. Everything I need to connect is there, right? So I could take one of these, in fact, uh, if I went out to, in fact, um, I have some shortcuts, like DSSH to me is I want to log in, do an SSH to my cluster. So I, I just do it every day so often that I kind of automated that, but this is using DCOS under the covers to automatically log into, oh, yeah. My bad. Helps if I, I, I rebooted my machine. Actually, my machine crashed yesterday, so uh, I just need to add a certificate into the my environment. Anyway, uh, I should land happily on the leader And this is just taking too long, but the core of it is I could do like some kind of Docker uh, connect to Cassandra kind of thing right here if I wanted to, and use that that IP address. And everything is just incredibly too slow. So, I don't know. any thoughts? Other thoughts or questions? So, uh, yeah, uh, speed ups. Um, 
What, what you're not seeing here, which is unfortunate because our display doesn't really show it too well, um, here's a list of nodes. Uh, when I spin up, here, let's just do it. If I have a service, let's say I want to deploy a new service, and I'll call him uh, Snorlax, right? Because I haven't got that Pokemon yet. <laughs> and Snorlax is going to sleep for a while. Uh, so I just say, hey, go run that. Now, the beauty is, is I don't know where, oh, what the heck did I miss? Oh, I think it's a latency issue. That's actually, I should report that as a bug. Um, so it's deploying now, but notice a couple things. Uh, it's a gray bar, it's running. It's gray bar because it didn't have a health check, but otherwise it's running. I didn't tell it where to go. I just said, hey, this takes one core. Uh, this takes, by default, 128 megs. It just landed out there. And this is that difference between capacity and scale that I wanted to mention, that I mentioned earlier on, is that um, imagine that's a Tomcat instance. Imagine that's behind an HA proxy or some kind of load balancer. But the default within DCOS is something called um, uh, Marathon LB, which is essentially HA proxy. So uh, I can just say I want, I want more instances of Snorlax. I go in here and I say, let's scale that up. I want that scaled up to three. Uh, again, if that's a Tomcat instance, it could land on the same node. Uh, we're inside of a container. Ports are already isolated. Whatever the ports, the service port is, will be automatically mapped to HA proxy. I am now scaling an application without changing anything about capacity. We have two knobs now that didn't exist. They, they used to be the same knob, but we, and we could talk about them separately uh, in, intellectually. But it was very rare to see an application um, managed physically in that way. And now we have that capability. And that's that's a Mesos. Uh, that's all the things we're talking about. Mesos, DCOS, and, uh, and Kubernetes all have similar abilities, um, similar to this. So. Oh, great. Yeah, great point. Uh, I, I should mention that, in fact. If we go to our nodes list here, um, it doesn't give us a whole lot of information. Uh, and, and, and I almost wanted this laid out in a different way. I don't have a whiteboard in front of me. But imagine, in this case, I have, what, six nodes, six or seven? Uh, imagine that three of those nodes live on rack A and uh, three of those nodes live on rack B. I, I can actually tell Marathon, hey, I want this to be evenly distributed across these fault domains. Uh, which means that I would have three on uh, rack A and three on rack B. And the beauty of that, of course, is that if a node goes down, it will try to re-recover on the fault domain that it was on. Um, so under the covers, this probably gets a little bit more technical, which probably makes people happy. Uh, under the covers, uh, all agents give up a certain amount of detail about the off, we call them offers. Agents will offer up, I have these resources, right? There are two things that come with a, an offer. One is resources, and the other is um, attributes. They are both arbitrary, uh, literally arbitrary. So by default, if you don't do any configuration whatsoever, we, uh, we investigate the node, and we go, oh, well, you've got four cores, and you've got 68 uh, gigs of RAM, uh, and we give four resources by default. Um, that's ports, what are your available ports, disk, uh, memory and CPU. But I could go in there and say, this node has a banana. A and if it's a resource I'm defining as a banana, if I have a job that consumes a banana or half a banana, it will have to land on an offer that came, that said it has a banana to give. And then it will consume that banana by whatever factor or scale or value you provide it. Uh, but that's how you would delineate, I have a page cache. So I'd, I'd say, hey, this has one page cache. Uh, and if I have a job like Kafka that says it consumes one page cache, well, then only one instance of Kafka or any other job that consumes a page cache can land there. Uh, and so you can self-heal, which is some amazing stuff. The other one is attributes. They're also arbitrary. And by default, I don't know if there are any other than host name. You can, you can delineate uniqueness by host name and say, I want to land on this node. I think that's dangerous, in my opinion, but there are times when it's useful. Um, it's dangerous in that you're going to... It's easy to get wrapped into, I want to build, build my own statically partitioned world, which is what you're trying to avoid, right? We want... I, 
I don't know if I followed it. You want? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess another, go ahead. Uh, I'm going to jump to an example of what these, so one of the things you might get into is, well, what, what, what does this job look like? What if I wanted to manage this separately outside of DCOS, which is a common thing to do. Um, this is, this is a, a marathon JSON file, which is a job that will be deployed. So I have a Docker container, which is my Tomcat instance, um, and this will be launching off by default one instance using a quarter of a core. So if, if I give you a concrete example, which is pretty much what we have, uh, we've got an Nginx front end, we've got Bear Iron, we've got Amazon, we wouldn't mind having some Google web services as well. Um, you're saying Mesos would look at all of the, the Bear Iron and the Amazon EC2 instances and any other instances, it would, it, it would consider all of that as, as nodes that you could define in a common way? Yeah, the, the, the beauty, if I understood your question correctly, of Mesos is that you have a complete abstraction of what you're on. Um, and that's why you see Netflix, Netflix is also moving to uh, Mesos. Their whole new uh, uh, platform as a service internally is gonna be Mesos based. Um, they, of course, are talking to Google. Um, and I think, it's a personal thought, right? Um, I think that they're talking with Google with the intention to stay with Amazon, but they need to have some pr press price pressure to make sure they don't get um, screwed by Amazon, right? So uh, there, are th there are two places, there are two factors to worry about. One is, is making sure you can move to a cloud that's cheaper, but the other is all the details of moving to a new cloud. Um, that completely goes away where I'm Amazon, uh, on Mesos. Mesos okay, so, uh, so completely abstracts that. What, what, what do we consider a node if we've got a bare iron box and, and a uh, EC2? Sorry, what, what, what do we consider as a node in Mesos if we've got a bare iron box and a EC2 instance are those two nodes, or um, I'm just uh, Nodes are defined, technically nodes are defined by wherever an agent is running. You, it is possible to have like two agents on a node, but you really wouldn't do that in the real world. Um, other, other points to this conversation is, and I've heard a couple of different thoughts on this, our position is that a cluster should belong in a, in a region or in a zone, uh, and, and that you probably shouldn't have cross data center. You shouldn't have a Mesos cluster that's defined across data center. Um, it's possible. Um, you need to tune things uh, for the latency associated with that, but it's very rare or unusual that you'd have something fail in DC1 and be recovered in DC2. Um, if you're worried about making sure that you have data replication, that's a different a different problem to solve, and there are a number of tools that solve that, like Cassandra is data aware, or data center aware, and can manage uh, replication across. You would probably have uh, orchestration tools on top of Mesos that would then move things from one data center to another data center. And we have some really interesting demos of being able to go like on-premise data center, take all these services, spin it up in the cloud, make sure that those services are up and running and healthy, and when they are healthy, then turn these off. So data migration, or no, data service migration uh, becomes really insanely simple, and, we, and through RESTful APIs. We do actually have uh, data centers across clusters, as long as the data centers are close enough. Um, and if they're far apart, then they're they're separated. Yep. But so what, what I'm trying to still understand, um, the t we, we've got uh, I think about 70 or 80 nodes in total. Uh, but if I take the two node example here, um, if I've got the bare iron node, I can virtualize that into into more n virtual nodes. And Mesos does that for you, or it's, it's, I'm trying to understand. Yeah, we <coughs> we can live completely on bare metal. Um, there's an operating system underneath, right? Like yeah. the, the two that we focus on right now. We it, it, there's no technical reason. Uh, it's just a resources reason. But we hyper focus on CoreOS on Amazon, uh, and we also are focused on Red Hat or CentOS things like that. But there's no re it can we've we've been on Ubuntu forever that kind of thing. We just don't focus on it right now. Uh, and, you know, whether a resource is virtualized or not is irrelevant to us. It's a set of resources. So it's also another play where you can say, well, we're virtualized now, and I want to move to bare metal. 
I can have a mixed model, heterogeneous model, um, and as I take a node down and remove all VMs and uh, spin it up, literally, I guess it's probably useful to see this again, literally uh, the idea of an agent or a set of resources being added to the cluster is literally take an image which has the Mesos agent or slave in it and when it spins up it will contact the zookeeper for where the heck is my Mesos leader it will then register with the, the leader and you magically have all those resources added so scalability again has two factors to it one is I'm scaling my app which is independent of capacity but spinning up capacity literally is create more instances of that image. It will auto add into the cluster and then just be available. We but, also but have- are, are you restricting access? Uh, so if I have a, a single box, are you, and I want to use it as two boxes, are you restricting the access or do we have to use? No restriction on that. Okay. Okay. Okay, so it, it, it's not about control, it's only about um, allocation and management. So when a, when, a, when a job lands, so the offer comes in, these are the technical under the covers terms, right? When an offer comes in, you can, uh, you can launch a task. When you launch a task, one of the things you could also do is reserve. So I can say that, that resources that I'm consuming there, that's not temporary, I'm reserving that for this, for me, <laughs> and then I'm consuming that. So if a process were to fail, I know I can land on the exact same space. Uh, which, is, which is cool. The other thing that's really strongly different, so I didn't really talk about Kubernetes much, or we haven't in here. One of the strong differences with Mesos and DCOS is that we also uh, added in last summer is the maintenance primitives, primitives. So you can provide a JSON example of a schedule uh, that you have, and as a scheduler, I can check the maintenance and go, oh crap, that node's going down next week. I slowly, I, as things test finish, I might wanna just like start uh, moving that to a different node. And so I have the ability to work within a data center in a very intelligent way, things you would expect, right? I, I wanna be able to, can, I wanna be able to gracefully drain a node, uh, things of this nature, and we have the primitives to do that. Not many people are taking advantage of that right now, but the primitives exist there within the, the abstraction cluster, we or the abstracted um, libraries we call Mesos. So, and then as someone brought up like different languages. So uh, Mesos is C++. Uh, the beauty of it is that it compiles to two megabytes. The agent is in extremely small. Uh, but almost all of the tooling, like the schedulers, almost all of them are Java in some way. The Marathon is Scala, uh, Kronos is Scala. Um, um, all, uh, we, have, we, we leverage a lot of Scala. Uh, the Cassandra, HDFS, uh, Spark, there's a number of them are, are, are Java uh, that are just straight Java 8. And uh, so it, it's an important part of what we're doing, for sure. Yeah, it's useful to know, especially you brought up Docker, our last release, which is this, this week, like it's happening now. Um, it was announced last week, but coming out this week, really. 
we, we, we call it container 2.0. I think it's interesting. It's marketing to me. But what it really means under the covers is that all, all, all up until now, we have used Docker processes to launch Docker instances. And container 2.0 to us is really the outcome of what we expected out of the open container initiative, uh, which really hasn't resulted in much. Uh, we spin up Docker instances without using Docker now. And there's some huge advantages to that. Um, one, the most significant one is it's unacceptable to us that if you were to uh, update or upgrade Docker, all uh, containers that Docker is currently running would uh, go down in the process of upgrading. And that, that is something we just don't, uh, it's not acceptable to us. Now you could, what's that? Is, is that true? They're, they're up there. Yeah, it's not a surprise. I'm, uh, clearly, they're, gonna, they're in, the, you know, in the market space as well and know what their deficiencies are. They've been hammered pretty hard on two things. One is networking and the other is this uh, updates. Um, so, um, and then you, you asked a question of dependency type stuff. It's worth noting is the, um, there are a bunch of, especially in the enterprise, challenges, right? You're never going to, you can't, it's not legally responsible to put WebSphere in a, in a Docker container. They don't know how to license it. So there's a ton of license. It's really a license restriction. How do you know how to charge for uh, arbitrary sets of scale? Uh, and um, so there's a ton of things in, uh, that, that we're seeing that people are in the enterprise are going to have challenges with as we move to this direction. And that's why we see almost always the entire stack being completely open source, either complete Java or open source. This is the most common, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, we've done a bunch of examples of serverless, and it's fairly easy to do, actually. If, if, fr frankly, we have something that we just changed the name of it, and I don't know the new name, but we've called it Infinity. Uh, we had originally called it the Smack Stack, and all that is is uh, Spark, Mesos, uh, Akka, uh, Kafka, I'm missing one, but the point is uh, Cassandra. Uh, the whole point is, is anything that you would see on Amazon as a product that they're selling, like Lambda Architecture or state, uh, serverless, uh, we're going to make available in our product, uh, again, as an open source type thing, you can do it on-prem. No ties to Amazon whatsoever, right? So in the Smack Stack, uh, you know, we have some really strong uh, desires for that. We're looking at, you know, the specs that I was given is a million 1K rights per second, uh, sustainable over a period of time that we have to be able to lose one of three fault domains and still maintain. So we, we have some pretty strict standards on it. We're also using, uh, we're using that stack internally as part of dog fooding to analyze our own problems with how long it takes to recover and all this other stuff. So we're getting lots of stats right now on recovery times and how quickly we can resolve that autom in an automated fashion. So some pretty cool stuff. I'm, I'm told we have a couple minutes. Or he's saying peace, brother. One of those two is true. <laughs> What's that? Oh, uh, oh yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So the, 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 history, the history there is that uh, Google created the Borg. Uh, that inspired Apache Mesos. Uh, uh, Yahoo looked at Apache Mesos and said, huh, not written in Java and not written here. So they created Yarn, yet another resource negotiator. It's another scheduler. And it surprises people. I'm also a committer, in fact, an early committer on a project called Myriad. And Myriad is essentially yarn on top of Mesos. And people start to wonder, like, why the heck would, they seem competitive. They're both orchestrators. Why would I put one on top of the other? Uh, and it's actually really cool. Uh, we also put Kubernetes on top of Mesos. So again, Mesos has no opinion, uh, which is awesome. Kubernetes has a, a strong opinion, which could be faster time to market. But I can increase or decrease the resource allocation of that opinion within a, a whole ecosystem that is managed by one uh, management tool. But the other side of it from the YARN perspective is the most common thing that you see when people want to move from one Hadoop to another Hadoop is I can't run them in the same cluster. So I have to allocate a whole other data center or a cluster of nodes in order for me to do a comparison, which is the first thing you're going to do of a V2 app versus a V1, make sure I get the same numbers, and I'm going to decommission V1. Uh, with Myriad, we can increase dynamically uh, the, the resources associated with V1 versus V2, and in fact, run them isolated in the same cluster. So, um, the, in fact, uh, stretch the mind just a bit. At Twitter, uh, they in production, 
uh, they, they actually run non-production things all the time. They run dev and testing type things in production. Why? Well, because if I allocate half of production to non-production things, and then I have some kind of crazy spike in, in needs for production, I can then reallocate those. I can destroy everything that's non-production and move all those resources to production without, without any downtime, without any thinking. It's true dynamic data center as opposed to that statically partitioned world that, that we looked at. So the ability to dynamically react. Uh, and the climax of this, we have three different types of people that use um, this type of technology. One is people doing microservices. The other is people doing analytics. But the most mature is the combination of those two, which I rarely see. It's very mature peop uh, organizations that do that. What they want is, I have all these web services. I have this analytics thing going on. And I'm going to consume all the, th the resources that are available that are not being used by my production. So, and if I need to switch it out, I'll switch it out. All right. All right, so we have one more session left for today. It's really a sad event. The last session for, uh, for jQuery 2016. Um, announcement. There will be a group photo after the last session. Um, I have to ask Stephen once again where we want to do it. The photo, the group photo, where are we going to do it? On the stairs? Yeah. Outside. Okay, after the last session, well, we all come back to this room, we close the conference, and then we all go together to the stairs on the main, main building to have a group photo. And 